Nuclear War Survival Skills, Chapter 10. Radi uh, fallout Radiation Meters, page 105. Additional information on accuracy and dependability. Readers who want additional technical information on the Kearney Fallout Meter are advised to buy a copy of the original Oak Ridge National Laboratory report on this instrument. The Kearney Fallout Meter, a homemade yet accurate and dependable fallout meter, ORNL-5040, corrected by Cresson H. Kearney, Paul R. Barnes, Conrad V. Chester, and Margaret W. Cortner. Date published January 1978. Copies are sold by the National Technical Information Service. U.S. Department of Commerce, 5285, Port Royal Road, Springfield, Virginia, 22161. Since the price continues to increase, it is best to write first to learn the postage paid cost. Civil defense professionals of foreign countries have also also have concluded that Kearney fallout meters have life-saving potential. The June 1978 special issue of the Journal of the Institute of Civil Defense, the premier society of disaster studies with headquarters in London, was entirely devoted to the Kearney fallout meter and gave international distribution to the original complete instructions and cut out paper patterns. The interest of Chinese civil defense officials in the Kearney fallout meter and my other low-cost survival inventions led to my making with White House approval two long trips in China as an official guest. In eight Chinese cities, I acquired survival know-how by exchanging civil defense information with top civil defense officials. A major disadvantage, a Kearney fallout meter looks like a toy. This instrument appears too simple to be trusted to measure deadly radiation. A frightening mystery to most people Typical moderns are accustomed to pushing buttons and twisting dials to get information instantly from instruments they do not understand. Most feel that a dependable radiation monitoring instrument has to be complex. However, Especially during a worsening nuclear crisis, many typical Americans would build Kearney fallout meters if they become convinced of the accuracy and dependability of this home makeable instrument that they can understand, use intelligently,
and repair if necessary. Caution. Earlier versions of the Kearney fallout meter making instructions written when common sewing threads were good insulators recommend sewing threads for suspending a Kearney fallout meters leaves. Now, most sewing threads are anti-static treated. Our poor insulators and are unsatisfactory for use in Kearney fallout meters. Makers of Kearney fallout meters should use the instructions in this updated edition that recommend widely available excellent insulators for suspending a Kearney fallout meters leaves and that incorporate several field tested design improvements. Instructions for making and using Kearney fallout meters. Appendix C gives the latest field tested instructions with patterns to enable you to make a Kearney fallout meter and to learn how to use it. The great need for civil defense instruments is likely to be fully recognized only during a worsening nuclear crisis. Therefore, in this edition, the Kearney fallout meter instructions and patterns are printed on only one side of a sheet with extra patterns at the end of the text. And with two pages at the very end to expedite the rapid reproduction of the Kearney fallout meter instructions. Timed printing tests by two newspapers have proved that with the help of these two pages of special instructions, a newspaper can paste up and photograph all pages of the Kearney fallout meter instructions. Print a 12 page tabloid giving them and start distributing the tabloid all in less than one hour. Thus, if you have a copy of this book during an all too possible nuclear crisis, you may be able to give these instructions to a newspaper and help thousands of your fellow citizens obtain the information that they need to make fallout meters for themselves. Advice on building a Kearney fallout meter. The reader is urged to set aside several hours in the near future for making a Kearney fallout meter and for mastering its use. During field tests, average American families have needed about six hours to study the instructions given in Appendix C to make this simple instrument and to learn how to use it. These several hours may not be available in the midst of a crisis. Higher priority work would be the building of a high protection factor shelter 
the making of a shelter ventilating pump, and the storing of adequate water. In a crisis, it might not be possible to obtain some needed materials for a Kearney fallout meter. It is very difficult to concentrate on unfamiliar details during a nerve-wracking crisis or to do delicate work with hands that may become unsteady. The best time to build and learn to use a Kearney fallout meter is in peacetime, long before a crisis. Then, this long-lasting instrument should be stored for possible future need. End of page. Page 106, Chapter 11, Light. The need for minimum light. Numerous disasters have proved that many people can remain calm for several days in total darkness, but some occupants of a shelter full of fearful people probably would go to pieces if they could see nothing and could not get out. It is easy to imagine the impact of a few hysterical people on the other occupants of a pitch dark shelter. Under wartime conditions, even a faint light that shows only the shapes of nearby people and things can make the difference between an endurable situation and a black ordeal. Figure 11.1 .1 shows what members of the Utah family saw in their shelter on the third night of occupancy. All of the family's flashlights and other electric lights had been used until the batteries were almost exhausted. They had no candles at home. Figure 11.11. .11. The night scene in a trench shelter without light. It's complete black. Failed to bring the cooking oil, glass jar, and cotton string included in the evacuation checklist. These materials would have enabled them to make an expedient lamp and to keep a small light burning continuously for weeks if necessary. At 2 a.m. on the third night, the inky blackness caused the mother, a stable woman who had never feared the dark, to experience her first claustrophobia. <clears throat> In a controlled but tense voice, she suddenly awoke everyone by stating, I have to get out of here. I can't orientate myself. Fortunately, for the shelter occupancy experiment, when she reached the entry trench, she became, she overcame her fears and laid down to sleep on the floor near the entrance. Conclusion, in a crisis, it is especially bad not to be able to see at all. Electric 
lights. Even in communities, outside areas of blast, fire, or fallout, electric lights dependent on the public power system probably would fail. Electromagnetic pulse effects produced by the nuclear explosions plus the destruction of power stations and transmission lines would knock out most public power. No emergency lights are included in the supplies stocked in official shelters. The flashlights and candles that some people would bring to shelters probably would be insufficient to provide minimum light for more than a few very days. A low amperage light bulb used with a large dry cell battery or a car battery is an excellent source of low level continuous light. One of the small 12 volt bulbs in the instrument panels of cars with 12 volt batteries will give enough light for 10 to 15 nights. End of page. Page 107. Without discharging a car battery so much that it cannot be used to start a car. Making an efficient battery powered lightning system for your shelter is work best done before a crisis arises. During a crisis, you should give higher priority to many other needs. Things to remember about using small bulbs with big batteries. Always use a bulb of the same voltage as the battery. Use a small, high resistance wire such as bell wire with a car battery. Connect the battery after the rest of the impro improvised light circuit has been completed. Use reflective material such as aluminum foil, mirrors, or whiteboards to concentrate a weak light where it is needed. If preparations are made before a crisis, small 12 volt bulbs, 0 0.1 to 0 0.25 amps with sockets and wire can be bought at a radio parts store. Electric test clips for connecting thin wire to a car battery can be purchased at an auto parts store. Candles and commercial lamps. Persons going to a shelter should take all their candles with them, along with plenty of matches in a waterproof container, such as a mason jar. Fully occupied shelters can become so humid that matches not kept in moisture proof containers cannot be lighted after a single day. 
lighted candles, and other fires should be placed near the shelter opening through which air is leaving the shelter to avoid buildup of slight amounts of carbon monoxide and other headache causing gases. If the shelter is completely closed for a time for any reason, such as to keep out smoke from a burning house nearby, all candles and other fires in the shelter should be extinguished. Gasoline and kerosene lamps should not be taken inside a shelter. They produce gases that can cause headaches or even death. If gasoline or kerosene lamps are knocked over as by blast winds that would rush into shelters over extensive areas, the results would be disastrous. Safe Expedient Lamps for Shelters The simple expedient lamps described below are the results of Oak Ridge National Laboratory experience, experiments which started with oil lamps of the kinds used by Eskimos and the ancient Greeks. Our objective was to develop safe, dependable, long-lasting shelter lights that can be made quickly using only common household materials. Numerous field tests have proved that average Americans can build good lamps by following the instructions given below, figure 11.2. These expedient lamps have the following advantages. They are safe even if a burning lamp is knocked over onto a dry paper. The flame is so small that it will be extinguished if the lamp fuel being burned is a cooking oil or fat commonly used in the kitchen. And if the lamp wick is not much larger than <coughs> one sixteenth inch in diameter. Since the flame is inside a jar, it is not likely to set fire to a careless person's clothing or to be blown out by a breeze. With the smallest practical wick and flame, a lamp burns only about one ounce of edible oil or fat in eight hours. Even with a flame smaller than that of a birthday candle, there is enough light for reading. To read easily by such a small flame, attach aluminum foil to three sides and the bottom of the lamp and suspend it between you and your book just high enough not to block your vision. 
During the long, anxious days and nights spent waiting for fallout to decay, shelter occupants will appreciate having someone read aloud to them. A lamp with aluminum foil attached is an excellent trap for mosquitoes and other insects that can cause problems in an unscreened shelter. They are attracted to the glittering light and fall into the oil. Two of these lamps can be made in less than an hour. Once the materials have been assembled, so there is no reason to wait until a crisis arises to make them. Oil exposed to the air deteriorates, so it is best not to store lamps filled with oil or to keep oil-soaked wicks for months. End of page.